Bertolt Brecht was a Marxist playwright and poet who lived from 1898 to 1956. As a playwright, Brecht saw the theatre less as entertainment and more a forum in which he could discuss political and social ideas. His most famous play is the 1938 play Life of Galileo. Life of Galileo is about variously the ethics of science and the moral responsibility of scientists, the tension between tradition and progress, and the stifling of new ideas by society, the state, or both. It uses the 1600s of Galileo's Italy as an analogue, and understandably so given that many of the play's themes were a little on the nose for Germany in 1938. Brecht is most famous for pioneering a form of theatre which he called epic theatre. Epic theatre is best summed up by the techniques it employs, which can be collected under the umbrella term Verfundung's effect. Nailed that pronunciation. Translated into English as defamiliarisation, distancing or alienation effect, or else just abbreviated to V effect, Verfundung's effect, nailed it again is a collection of techniques designed to frustrate audiences. So how could I possibly look inside? I'm afraid. Who's afraid? I... I'm afraid. Brecht wanted his audiences to engage intellectually and critically with the themes and ideas in his plays. His theory was that they couldn't do so if they were too emotionally involved in the characters and the story. To that end, Brecht's techniques were designed to distance the audience from the play by drawing attention to the artificiality of the play and the stage. They would therefore bring the audience out of the action and force them to pay attention rather than sit and watch passively. Theatre goers would therefore be treated to such things as uncomfortable lighting, on stage title placards, and garish or out of place costume and makeup design. Actors would on occasion recite their stage directions, burst into song, deliver their lines with unusual intonations and cadences, and sometimes just address the audience directly. The American Film Theatre's 1975 film version of Life of Galileo, directed by Joseph Losey and starring Fiddler on the Roof's Topol as Galileo, is a pretty good introduction to Brecht's epic theatre and to his techniques. It's actually a fairly traditional adaptation which only occasionally employs Brechtian techniques, such as when Topol delivers his lines direct to camera, or the actors perform in front of a white screen onto which their shadows are transposed. But beyond these little Brechtian flourishes, it's actually played pretty straight. It's a fairly literal interpretation of the text, which in turn makes it a fairly accessible introduction to Brecht's work, if you're interested. So that was a pretty fast and loose primer on Brechtian theatre, but that's only because it's not really why we're here. Why we're here is a recent article in The Telegraph titled Globe Theatre Issues Suicide Trigger Warning on Romeo and Juliet. The article is not a review of the play, it exists only to give the clickbait title a reason to exist. It is therefore a bizarre and banal piece of news with basically nothing to say except that here's a thing you'll probably be angry about, you should click the link to find out why. The thing in question is those aforementioned trigger warnings, which the Globe Theatre is attaching to Ola Ince's current adaptation of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. These warnings come predominantly in the form of a primer on references to or depictions of suicide, drug use, violence, gunshot sound effects and fake blood. They're also kind of present throughout the play. The action stops for the cast to directly address the audience about the themes in the play. A screen at the back of the stage lights up with various facts about mental health, gang crime and other relevant societal issues. It all sounds a bit, well, Brechtian. The Telegraph has little to say about the play itself, which suggests that neither writer Craig Simpson nor anyone else at the Telegraph has seen the adaptation, or indeed cares very much for the adaptation. 
it comes across as hurried and lazy. And reading it, you get the impression that Simpson had to Wikipedia Romeo and Juliet while writing the article just to have something to pad it out with. As you might have gathered then, the whole thing is really just empty culture war nonsense written in the service of website clicks. For example, Simpson's opening statement asserts that Romeo and Juliet audiences have been given an entire page of warnings about suicide, fake blood, and stage fighting. The phrase entire page is doing a lot of heavy lifting here. For reference, this is what he's talking about. The article itself is pretty cowardly, relying almost entirely on the phrase trigger warning to do all of the work. It therefore doesn't have to do anything as garish or nakedly open as criticise the globe. It only needs to imply to its readers what it assumes they already think. That entire pages of trigger warnings about fake blood and gunshot noises are symptoms of political correctness creeping into and corrupting the theatre. Theatre goers have been warned about moments of violence in the 400 year old tragedy and cautioned about the presence of fake blood on stage. So this last statement isn't noteworthy on its own, but that's because it's not really a statement. It's actually its own hyperlinked clickbait title, which if you click on it, will take you to a Telegraph opinion piece from Celia Walden. Celia Walden incidentally is the daughter of Conservative MP George Walden and the wife of one Piers Morgan. Walden's article is revealingly titled, This Woke Romeo and Juliet Proves Even Shakespeare Is Not Safe From Revisionists. Romeo and Juliet really is in quotation marks. So Walden's piece is the usual, woke lefties are ruining everything hack job. What's going to be ruined for me today? What splendid piece of language, history, art or architecture is going to be labelled offensive, problematic or wrong before being either cancelled or bastardised? Spoilers, it's Romeo and Juliet of course. Romeo and Juliet has been cancelled and or bastardised. Apparently. So this is ironic for many reasons. Um, many reasons which we will get into later. Or now. Let's get into them now. So if Celia Walden wants to complain that woke lefties are ruining art and language in general and Shakespeare in specific, I think it's only fair to let her know that Shakespeare has actually already been ruined by history's original woke snowflakes, the Victorians. Because of course he was. The image we have today of Shakespeare, the way we interpret his texts and by and large perform his plays, what we think of as the traditional or correct way of doing Shakespeare. We talk here in the public haunt of men. Either withdraw unto some private place or reason coldly of your grievances. Or else depart. Here all eyes gaze on us. Is a Victorian era fabrication. It is in fact the result of, let's just say, Victorian revisionism. This is a frankly simpering, sterilised, watered-down version of Shakespeare with the chaotic violence and spectacle and dirt and all of the sex jokes, and there are so many sex jokes, removed so as not to offend the delicate, repressed sensibilities of the Victorians. This is why Shakespearean productions since the Victorian era have typically been performed in Received Pronunciation or RP. Also known as BBC English or the Queen's English, this is how foreigners tend to think that English people speak if the English person is in a cockney. Oh, what, ladies and gents, comical poem, suitable for the occasion, extemporised and thought up before your very eyes. It's also, despite what you've been led to believe, a fairly young accent and one used by only about 3% of the UK's population. 
It wasn't first defined until 1869, and even then it did not become popular until phonetician Daniel Jones adopted it for the second edition of the English Pronouncing Dictionary in 1924. Received pronunciation is not the accent Shakespearean plays would have been spoken in when they were written. In fact, augmented onto Shakespearean texts, RP has the tendency to sometimes flatten the language, and at its very worst, it mangles the meaning of the text and indeed the words themselves. Romeo, the love I bear thee can afford no better term than this. Thou art a villain. Tybalt, the reason that I have to love thee doth much excuse the appertaining rage to such a greeting. Villain, am I none? Therefore farewell. I see thou knowest not me. <laughs> Shakespeare himself had what we would think of as a more earthy and almost black country accent. It's an accent which would deliver lines like, So from hour to hour we ripe and ripe, and from hour to hour we rot and rot, and thereby hangs a tale. As, So from oar to oar we ripe and ripe, and then from oar to oar we rot and rot, and thereby hangs a tale. It's a really, really rude sex joke. So all of the culture war nonsense about Shakespeare having been diluted by woke lefties only works if you ignore the facts and the history and cling to the revisionist Victorian ideal as the real, authentic version of Shakespeare. Which again, just to reiterate, it is not. But ultimately, the argument over what constitutes authentic Shakespeare is pointless, because there is no such thing as authentic Shakespeare. For one thing, Shakespeare didn't even write his plays down, and in fact it's possible that he couldn't write his plays down. There's no hard evidence that Will Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon, 1564-1616, revered as the greatest author in the English language, could even write a complete sentence. In fact, the earliest written examples of Shakespeare's works were transcribed seven years after his death, collated and edited by John Hemming and Henry Condell, who had acted in Shakespeare's plays. They were cobbled together in what became Shakespeare's first folio. How many of these, if any, Shakespeare actually wrote is unknown and, at this point, impossible to verify since the only examples we have of Shakespeare's actual written word amount to no more than six signatures. So Walden's opinion piece runs through the usual right-wing commentator's bingo card of things to be angry about. Chief among them is the fact that Ola Ince's new production of Romeo and Juliet is obviously too woke. Star-crossed lovers? No, Romeo and Juliet were just depressed teenagers. Of course they were. How did we not see this coming? Because for Ola Ince, who is directing a radical new interpretation of the play at Shakespeare's Globe, no less, this was a no-brainer. Quite literally. You see, the protagonists never really made sense until the 32-year-old decided to turn the most famous love story of all time into a parable about depression, teenage suicide, and societal failures. Celia Walden suggesting that Romeo and Juliet is not about teenage suicide. So in Celia Walden's world, this is of course a sign that all theatre has been ruined for all time, that all Shakespeare productions must henceforth be analysed according to some form of psychobabble, whatever she means by that. The implication is that we're ruining Shakespeare by overthinking it, by analysing Romeo and Juliet in terms of things like mental illness, instead of just letting it be the love story Walden thinks it is. That we should just enjoy Shakespeare for being Shakespeare. So Walden gets a bit overexcited at her own undeserved wit in this next bit. To that aim, let's reduce all of Shakespeare's works to psychobabble. King Lear clearly suffers from narcissistic personality disorder, with a bit of intermittent explosive disorder thrown in. Hamlet has borderline personality disorder, and Othello's even got a syndrome named after him. 
So this is all weird, considering that these aren't examples of psychobabble, but actual real disorders. Othello syndrome is a real form of paranoid delusional jealousy that was coined not by woke lefties overthinking Shakespeare, but by psychiatrist John Todd in 1955. He named it Othello syndrome precisely because its symptoms accurately mirror the behaviour of Othello in the popular William Shakespeare play Othello. You know what, I think that's about as much of that as I can stomach. Besides, Romeo and Juliet still exists. You know Celia, the play you're pretending to be concerned about, the one you think has been ruined? It's still there. You don't have to watch this one. But let's not be naive, none of this is actually the point. It's not clear if Celia Walden even believes in or cares about what she's saying, or if she's just sort of fed keywords into a telegraph opinion piece generator. Regardless, she's either deliberately missing the point or she just doesn't care that there is a point. Telegraph readers, after all, do need something to keep them riled up. So in the interests of critical thinking and not ending up as a bitter douchebag telegraph opinion piece writing hack, I do think it's important to talk about what Ola Ince's production of Romeo and Juliet really is and what it's trying to do. Because, and to bring this back to the topic of Brecht's epic theatre, it's not even really a production of Romeo and Juliet. Ola Ince's production is instead a discussion predominantly about youth suicide, but it also touches upon gang violence and other societal issues which affect young people today, with Romeo and Juliet as a backdrop and a convenient jumping off point. There's always something left unsaid, and Romeo and Juliet really tries to explore that. Young people are sadder than they've ever been and it feels like the world around them is becoming less hopeful. This is a fact missed not only by Celia Walden in The Telegraph, but by the author of this 21st August tweet, which was written in response to that first Telegraph article. The actors were excellent, but had to pause after every scene change to talk to the audience about youth crime or women upholding the patriarchy before getting back to it. Suffice to say, this is missing the point. That the actors break character to talk to the audience, that the screen displays real life facts and figures, is very deliberate. In the best traditions of Brecht's epic theatre, Ince's production of Romeo and Juliet is designed to frustrate its audience's expectations of the play and to undermine the romanticism which interpretations of the play are traditionally based around. Romeo doff thy name. And for that name which is no part of thee, take all myself. <laughs> <laughs> I take thee thy word. <gasps> Remember, Romeo and Juliet is a play in which two teenagers fall in love and are married within about four days of meeting, and then they subsequently kill themselves because their families are involved in a pointless feud and won't just let them be together. Inter's Romeo and Juliet therefore provides trigger warnings, not as Celia Walden thinks, to protect the woke lefty snowflakes, but to draw awareness to the ongoing and very relevant issue of youth suicide and mental health. The presence of the Samaritans and the listening places phone numbers on the Globe's website is not out of fear that millennial snowflakes will be driven to suicide by the raw power of Shakespeare. It's because those people who are already troubled by suicidal thoughts or who know somebody who is troubled by suicidal thoughts might see the production and be inspired to seek help. A Freedom of Information Act request from two years ago reveals 5,688 deaths by suicide in 2019. Of those, 2,135 were of people aged between 10 and 39 years of age. The most stark and worrying statistic in all of this is that 11 children between the ages of 10 and 14 committed suicide in 2019. Just a reminder, this is before the effects of coronavirus on everybody's mental health.
We actually understand what it's like to be isolated from our friends and to experience a pandemic. That's exactly what's happening in Romeo and Juliet. So missing from these statistics is the number of young people who have attempted suicide or who have self-harmed with the intent to commit suicide. According to University College London's Millennium Cohort Study, the statistic at age 17 is 10% of females and 4% of males. And so in this, the year of our Lord COVID 2021, Romeo and Juliet is for many people no longer just a tragic and romantic love story of star-crossed lovers. I take thee thy word. <gasps> but a stark reminder of a very real problem. It's a problem that as the years get shittier for young people with no promise of a bright future, or really at this stage, any kind of future. Young people are sadder than they've ever been, and it feels like the world around them is becoming less hopeful. It's just gonna get worse. In that context, it is therefore fairly insulting to complain that Ola Inz's production of Romeo and Juliet is too woke, that trigger warnings about youth suicide are ridiculous hyperbole, that Brechtian techniques designed to get you to think about youth suicide are distracting you from the play about youth suicide. Ola Inz's production is ultimately a way of bringing attention to a problem that relatively few people seem to care about and seemingly have no interest in even trying to care about. That includes people like Celia Walden and Craig Simpson at The Telegraph because at the end of the day, you've got to get those angry website clicks. You've got a culture war you got to go win. It's not even true, you motherfucker. Thanks, thank you. You're in the army as well, Danny boy, or I'm in the army as well, Danny boy. And when I see old pals like you, I'm glad I'm in the army too. Had you never seen me here before? I had never seen you here before. That's all right, Dan, for a man is a man. You needn't shout really, Dan.